All right, so here we go with our chapter 19 video lecture. Now we're going to start looking at the gunpowder empires, uh, or the Islamic gunpowder empires to be more exact. Uh, so the Islamic empires, uh, there's three of them. There is the Ottoman Empire, which is going to be run by the Turks, the Ottoman Turks. Uh, the Safavid Empire, which is going to be centered in Persia, which is, of course, modern-day Iran. Uh, and then the Mughal Empire, uh, which is going to be in India. So these are the three Islamic gunpowder empires. We are in time period four. Uh, we're looking at the early modern era from 1450 all the way to 1750. So these three empires all have a similar origin. And uh, they're similar because they're all land based empires. So they're going to be different than the uh, maritime empires that the Europeans are developing during this time. Uh, and these, ten, these uh, empires are going to be kind of like uh, the continuation of earlier empires like the Mongol empires or the Islamic caliphates. Uh, and therefore they're going to be fighting over the same territories. They're going to be incorporating new technologies, gunpowder weapons like muskets and cannons, uh, and use this to conquer and expand uh, throughout uh, the Middle East, throughout the Mediterranean, and throughout Southern Asia, throughout India. Um, now, all of these are going to be Islamic empires. They're all going to follow one form of Islam or another. Remember, Islam has two kind of like major divisions, uh, two sects. Uh, one is the Shia and one is the Sunni, and this goes back uh, when uh, the you know after Muhammad's death, and the question was who should be uh, the, the 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 caliph or the caliph, right? Who should be the person who follows Muhammad, the successor Muhammad, and that's where the arguments between the Sunni and the Shia originated from. So those two religions are going to continue; are going to become the main religions of these three empires. And again, these empires are going to be forged out of the former empires of the post-classical era, the Byzantines, the Muslims, the Caliphate, uh, and the, um, the Mongols, and the Sultanate of Delhi. All right, so they're going to have, uh, each one is going to have a founder. Um, and here you see the three guys. And if you notice, they're all the same kind of looking guys and this, you know, they, they're the same culture. Because all of these empires are going to be founded by people of Turkish ancestry, right? People who, uh, you know, their ancestors were the Turks uh, from Central Asia, right? The semi-nomadic people from Central Asia. Um, so the Ottomans are going to be, you know, are going to have uh, Turks. The Safavids are going to have Turks in there. The Mughals are going to have Turks. And the point is that these three are... Uh, these three founders, Osman, Ismail, and Babur, uh, they're all going to have the same title of emperor, you know, or sultan or shah, same thing. Uh, and they're all going to have the same background. They're going to wear the same stupid looking hair dress thing. Anyways, um, all of these empires are also going to be uh, created after Tamerlane's empire. So Tamerlane was this a like, crazy emperor dude. Uh, he was uh, part Turkish, part Mongol. Uh, he creates, you know, after the Mongol Empire collapses, right, all, all the Khanates, the Khanates, right, they break apart. Uh, he kind of like picks up the pieces and unites um, parts of the Middle East, parts of India, parts of uh, Turkey, parts of Russia, parts of Central Asia, uh, increases a huge empire, uh, the Timurlings Empire. Um, and he unites these people through religion, right? So he is going to be super, super devout to Islam. He's going to be very, very, very um, supportive of Islamic culture and Islamic education and architecture. So he's going to build a whole bunch of mosques and palaces. Uh, but he's going to be very intolerant to other religions. And they feel that, like, you know, you have to unite the people using religion. Uh, which is something that's you know been occurring over and over in world history, um, and this you know idea of like you know, you fight in the name of the religion is and becomes known as the Ghazi ideals, 
Uh, and these are like, you know, religious soldiers who are devoted to fight, you know, in, in the name of Islam. Uh, so by using religion, he creates this empire, even though it's very short-lived, because after he dies, it kind of like breaks apart, uh, because it wasn't very centralized at all. Um, but anyways, this kind of lays the, the framework, the blueprints of what the other empires are going to do, which is use religion uh, to unify the people and to use war and conquest to also unify their empire. Anyways, uh, let's talk about the first of the three, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, right? Nowadays we call this Turkey, right? Uh, but at its height, and this empire lasted for almost 700 years, right? Super long empire. Uh, at its height, it controlled a lot of, you know, the Mediterranean. So it controlled Egypt, it controlled North Africa, it controlled a big chunk of Eastern Europe. See this area, this is ca called the Balkans, right? Uh, the Balkans is in Southeast Europe, right? Southeast Europe. Um, so places like Greece and Serbia and I forgot the other places. Um, well, anyways, Hungary, there's another one. Uh, so those are, that's the, called the Balkans and that's where uh, the Ottoman Empire ruled into an era that used to be Byzantine territory. So there's going to be a lot of Christians there. They're going to control Turkey, right, which back then would have been called Anatolia. And they're going to control this right here. That's Iraq, right, Mesopotamia. We see the Tigris and the Euphrates River. They controlled Egypt. They controlled parts of Arabia, uh, including Mecca. Um, so this was a very large empire. And this is the empire, of course, that had the monopoly on the overland trade routes, right, between the East, uh, the Middle East, and Europe. And this is, you know, the empire that caused the Europeans to start exploring. So, uh, it was of the three, this is the longest lasting one, this was the strongest one, uh, even though it wasn't the wealthiest one, that's the Indian one. Anyways, it starts, uh, basically starts with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire uh, in 1453. Uh, we see it, Constantinople gets conquered, uh, they break down the walls of Constantinople using, um, using cannons uh, for the first time. Uh, Constantinople be, re, is renamed as Istanbul, as it is called now, and Istanbul becomes the capital of the Ottoman Empire. Um, now, what they start doing is, so they, they go into and they conquer these lands in the Balkans, right, Southeast Europe, uh, and this place used to be filled with Christians, Orthodox Christians, right, because again, these people used to be part of the Byzantine Empire. So the people of Southeast Europe, the Balkans, uh, they're going to have to supply soldiers to the Ottoman Empire. But it wasn't like a normal, like, draft. This was known as the Dev Shurim, Shurime, um, system. So basically, the way this works is every year the, the Ottoman Empire will come into your house and count your family members, right? And if you had young boys, only boys, of a, up to a certain age, uh, they would kidnap you and your family would be forced to surrender this child to the Ottoman government. Then the Ottoman government will raise the child, educate the child, convert the child. Sometimes they would castrate the child so that they become eunuchs, meaning that they will not be able to physically reproduce offspring. And they will kind of be brainwashed in a sense, and they will be raised to become the most loyal soldiers of the Ottoman Empire. And the group of these soldiers became known as the Janissary Corps. And the Janissaries uh, are going to become like the main fighting force of the Ottoman Empire. And remember, these are former Christian kids who are forcibly converted, right? And um, sometimes if they're really, really smart, then they wouldn't go into the military. They would be allowed to go in into the, um, into the bureaucracy, into the administration. Um, so the Janissaries are going to play a critical role uh, in this, the expansion and the maintenance of the Ottoman Empire. Um, again, they're going to have, they're going to be absolutely loyal to the Sultan, right, the Emperor. Uh, they're not going to have any kids, they're not going to have any wives, many of them physically couldn't have kids. 
um, and they're going to they're going to uh, become a major political and military force, right? They're going to control the government, all right, because they're going to be the administrators of the government. They're going to be the main fighting force, so they're going to like uh, lead the armies. Um, and the sultan is going to trust them, especially the ones who can't have kids, uh, because there was this mentality that, you know, you, you're not going to want to, like, rebel or go against your emperor um, if you can't pass down the benefits of the rebellion to your children, to your offspring. So, like, if I want to rebel against the emperor, it's because I want a better place for me and my family. But if I don't have a family then there's less of an incentive for me to fight against and rebel against my emperor. Uh, and that's what the Janissaries were, right? They were like controlled, powerful force, uh, but they tended to remain loyal to the emperor. Now, the Janissary Corps was so successful, right? And these guys, you know, the, these soldiers, upper class, became, they became upper class. Uh, these administrators, these soldiers, they became the upper class in Turkey, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, what we start seeing eventually is that families are actually going to be willing and hoping and praying that, they're, that the government's going to come and take their kids from them and brainwash them because it was a route for social mobility. Because Christians living in the Ottoman Empire, uh, even though they're going to have religious freedom and tolerance, they're going to have very restricted opportunities to move up in society. Right, but the Janissaries was an option. So families are actually going to willingly, voluntarily give up their kids because they knew it was a chance for social mobility. Kind of crazy. Now the greatest of these emperors, of course, is this guy called Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, and Suleiman, uh, he brings about the golden age. So he's going to expand the empires to its height. He's even going to start attacking the Holy Roman Empire, attacking, attacking Austria. He almost conquers the capital of Vienna, which is right in the center of Europe. The Europeans were terrified of this guy. That's why he gets his name, the Magnificent. That's what the Europeans called him. Because no one, no one knew who this guy was. And he was, had all this power uh, and all his wealth. He develops a navy uh, so that they can control maritime trade around the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Um, and he, he's, all, he's also known as the lawgiver because he changes up the, uh, the legal code. Uh, remember, because in the past it would just rely on the Sharia legal code, which is the Islamic religious laws. Uh, but he kind of combined that with some of the uh, more like civil laws, right, of like, you know, government, of uh, non-religious laws. So he was considered the magnificent, and obviously his headdress is going to be super huge because he was magnificent. And this is his palace, right? He built this awesome palace, you know, where a huge complex where they get to, where he and his family and all his wives, because he had many wives, uh, get to live in isolation from the rest of the world and in absolute luxury, uh, super wealthy uh, uh, place to live, right? Uh, and it shows us how wealthy, you know, powerful the Ottoman Empire was because they could build such magnificent things. Uh, the Ottomans, uh, they're going to have a very diverse population. You know, so they're going to have people from North Africa, they're going to have people from Egypt, they're going to have uh, Jewish people, they're going to have Christian people, they're going to have former Byzantine people, they're going to have Greeks, they're going to have Russians, they're going to have um, uh, Arabs, they're going to have Mesopotamians, right? All these different various ethnic groups, various religious groups, various cultural groups, right? Um, and in order to kind of like keep things under control, the Ottomans are going to create the millet system. So basically, they were going to like a Christian or Jewish neighborhood uh, and tell them, all right, look, everyone needs to pay taxes, everyone needs to follow the laws of the empire, uh, but education and law enforcement and anything else is up to you. You guys choose your leaders, your local like you know, representatives, uh, and you guys you know, work things out and you could, you know, go to church and pray and do everything else you want. Uh, as long as you follow, you know, the law and pay the taxes, right? They would charge 
the jaza tax, right? Uh, forcing them to, you know, because they're non-Muslims. So they were give the, the, these Jewish and Christian communities living within the Ottoman Empire were granted religious tolerance. They had to pay taxes though. Um, and were, were given some levels of kind of like self-governance, self-rule. They were like responsible for themselves. Uh, and the Ottomans weren't in there like trying to convert them or forcing them to convert or anything like that. All right, uh, so we're going to stop here because this video has gone too long already. Uh, this is part one. I will see you next time for part number two, uh, where we're going to look at the other two gunpowder empires, the Persians and the Mughals. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for learning. I'll see you next time.